Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 137. I hope you are well. It is hot, it is sunny. I've got to take the kids swimming. I've just had a very sad chorizo related incident. I've been thinking about, I, I make this chorizo potato chicken tray bake. It is always a winner. It is so easy to make. And I made it on Friday and all morning I've been thinking about the leftover chorizo that I was going to have for my lunch. And I absentmindedly put them on a non-microwavable plastic plate and incinerated them in the microwave so that they are now just chorizo burnt through with plastic. And that, that sums up sums up my current existence I feel there's a case that we're going to do today that I has been on my radar for a while and there's there's it feels solvable whilst at the same time is completely unsolvable I believe today we're going to talk about the the case of Reed Taylor Jepson I there's a very good blog with this covered called neverseenagain.wordpress.com. Crime Junkie Podcast did an excellent episode on this. There's Wikipedia pages. There's lots to be found, but nothing that in-depth. Crime Junkie Podcast is great because they've spoken to people involved in the case. But I, it, you'll see what I, what I mean when I say that this feels solvable, whilst also probably not being solvable. We're going to Salt Lake City, Utah in the 1960s. In the 1960s, though the the city was growing, it still maintained its small town feel. It had strong community vibes, a slower pace of life, and it had traditional values, community-centric living, and it's heavily influenced by the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, LDS Church. The LDS Church plays a central role in the social fabric of Salt Lake City and in the Jepson family and many community activities and events centered around church life. And I think religion is responsible for a lot of bad things in the world, but when it works right, it can create a lovely space for families and for people to feel secure and safe. And as far as I can tell, the Jepson family, which was a mother uh, father and 12 children felt fully involved and embraced by that community and it gave them the 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 nice bits that you want from a religious upbringing they had the church community church events and Though the era was marked by a mix of conservative values and the beginning of social change, the civil rights movement starting to make its impact felt. I mean, it, the city was slower to integrate compared to other parts of the country, so it wasn't great for that. Women were beginning to enter the workforce in greater numbers, but still adhered to the tra- to traditional roles at home. But as far as the Jepsons were concerned, this worked for them. They were a happy, secure family. So Salt Lake City is foothills, ravines, mountains. There's lots of outdoor activities to take part in and that th- th- they were outdoorsy family. But this is October when we're going to start this case. So that's something that's important to bear in mind. It wasn't, it's not California in October. It's Utah in October. We are going to Sunday the 11th of October in 1964, the Jepson family have gone to church in the morning and they come home for lunch. Suzanne, who is one of the daughters, I think she's in charge of making the lunch, traditional Sunday lunch, which I I believe was going to be roast beef. And 15-year-old Reed goes upstairs to get changed out of his smart church clothes into relatively uh, smart non-church clothes. He's wearing a white shirt. Um, and he goes through the kitchen, picking up a can of dog food on his way. And Suzanne says, what, what are you doing? And we're due to have lunch in 30 minutes. And he says, he's going off to feed, uh, and let the dogs out basically. Now these are his dogs, two dogs, German short haired pointers 
two-year-old Bess and Anne, who is a puppy, and they are very much his dogs. They are not family pets. His father agreed to him getting the dogs if he did everything for them, and he even took on a paper round to pay to feed the dogs. And they are kept about two. They're kept about two hundred yards from the house at the end of the garden, and he uh, is devoted to them. He loves them. He's training them to hunt birds, and. When he doesn't return for lunch, it's slightly unusual because Suzanne said to him, we're having lunch in 30 minutes, and he had said he'd be back. But they don't know that he's not out late, you know, walking the dog slightly further than he'd planned or he's stopped to talk to someone. He then doesn't attend the afternoon church service, which the rest of the family does and which would be normal for him on a Sunday. but. Again, they're not too worried. He is a good boy. And obviously, good boys can can have their moments and everything, but they weren't concerned. They assumed he must have gone to a friend, got caught up helping someone. And though it was sort of unlike him, they weren't worried. But after all the other kids go to bed and he's still not there, this really is out of character. and. The parents call the police at 12.42 a.m. You know, they've waited and waited and waited, and they're finally like, no, he's never done anything like this before. It's a school night. Uh, he's, you know, a good good student, happy at school. And so they, they call in the police. And an extensive search is immediately started. Though police kind of assume that he's a runaway There's no sign of the dogs, so the dogs are gone. So they just think that he's taken his dogs and run away. His parents and his family completely disagree with this. He has taken, he has some money on him, but he has more money saved at home. He is wearing a sort of reversible parka and a white shirt. And it's October. He's well aware. He's an Eagle Scout. So he is well aware of the elements. He's not dressed appropriately for being out overnight in October. He is not, you know, his dogs are his most important thing to him. He doesn't have anything for them. He doesn't have food for them or anything like that. And He's got loads of friends. He's got friends at school, friends at church. He's doing well in his sophomore year. He just scored his first touchdown for the football team. He has his paper route, which he loves doing. He's not got any spare clothes with him. So for the family, this really is not only unlike him to disappear or to run away, but it's unlike him to, if he was going to run away, just go so unprepared. And so the police, they contact a, a girl in Wyoming where he, he's had a sort of, not a relationship, I don't think, but a sort of close friendship. And the family have a ranch there that they spend the summer at. So they contact her to see if perhaps he's gone to see her. She hasn't seen or heard from him. Police speak to his younger brother John. John shares a room with Reed. They're really close in age. They're very close brothers. They they share the paper route together. They share the bedroom together. And police basically drive him to a a lay-by and then really go in hard on questioning him to see if He knows where Reed is. He says, you know, what you're doing is really upsetting your parents and your family. And uh, we're going to make you do a a, their version of a a lie detector test. And that's going to show that you're lying to us and blah, blah, blah. And eventually John gets so upset that he's like, please take me to do the test. I want to do the test because I don't know anything. And he realizes that his parents must have okayed this kind of interrogation with the police and he finds that upsetting and he says to them why did you allow this to happen and they were like we would just we will do anything to get him back you know they were so concerned for him 
and they just wanted their boy back. So in November, that as with a lot of, of, of missing persons cases, they they have some tips that come in, but nothing that can really be proved or verified. And what's really noticeable, of course, is that if Reed is around, he will have these two dogs with him. And they're not that they're they're reasonably unusual dogs and big dogs. So you know, that any teen that's found, does he have these dogs with him? In November, they learn about a teen who's registered at a hotel. They compare his handwriting and it's, it's not a match. There's also no mention of him having dogs with him. And there's just no way that he would be without them. If something terrible had happened to the dogs, it, it, it just seems very unusual. So, so this teen is not to be read. They have more potential sightings. They have people who say they've seen the dogs on a, on a motorway. None of this can be substantiated and none of it is very convincing and none of it is convincing sightings to the family. Neither Reed Taylor Jepson nor his two dogs, Bess and Anne, were ever seen again. Reed was born on the 28th of May, 1949. He's one of 12 children born to Edward and Elizabeth Jepson. And the, the family are lovingly, the, the kids are lovingly referred to as Elizabeth's Baker's Dozen by the community. They're very popular. Um, you know, they're part of their church community. They own a large property with a really big plot of land that's at nine... 1951 Browning Avenue in Salt Lake City. And then they have this ranch in Wyoming where they go every summer. And the, my interest really is in this backyard. In the words of Reed's nephew, quote, the Jepson family backyard was enormous, less of a yard than a giant field. Back then, we're talking rural in a safe neighborhood. I doubt there was even a fence. And the Jepsons had lots of different animals. They had rabbits and they had animals in the backyard. And it was Reed, as I said earlier, he had the passion for the dogs and he was training them. And they were kept in kennel at the end of the property. And this property backed onto a neighbor's. And I think originally it was their land that they then sold for a house to be built onto it. So it backs onto the neighbor's garden. And at this time, that house was in the process of being built. And there's no evidence that there's a fence there. So it's a very open backyard. The family's close knit, well known, popular in the community. They're part of the Latter day Saints church. It, Reed's father is a doctor, so he has, you know, he's known in the community for that. And he's, Reed himself is at the East High School as a sophomore. He's an active member of the Eagle Scouts. He's just started playing football for his school. And he's described as popular with friends in Utah and Wyoming. At the time of his disappearance, he's five foot six. He's wearing jeans, a white shirt, a reversible parka, and he has braces on the top and bottom sets of teeth. And he does look kind of like an all-American boy. He does really remind me of, do, if anyone ever watched Friday Night Lights, there's Landry in Friday Night Lights, who's now in lots of films. He's in Jungle Cruise as the naughty German. Um, but he kind of looks a bit like that. And, you know, there is, we all, all often say there's no reason for this person to disappear, but there really was no reason for him to disappear. And it was just so unlike him. On the night he disappeared, his brother John remembers going to bed thinking, oh my goodness, Reed is going to be in so much trouble when he gets home for missing dinner and missing church. Obviously, he's never going to see his brother again. In the days following his disappearance, hundreds of people join in this search. They have the school football team, school friends. His sister um, signs off for, for, you know, compassionate leave off college so that she can help look for him. The family do not stop. They never stop. They still haven't stopped. 
And, you know, this is not a small search. And you can't help but think if something had happened while he was on a walk, if he'd been, if, if the three of them had been hit by a hit and run, you'd find evidence. Uh, if something had happened, you know, it's very hard for a person to accidentally disappear, you know, in, in a local area, but with two big dogs. It's very, it's very weird that they have just vanished into nowhere. And, and that's basically what's happened. Now, they have one witness who comes forward who's saying that it, they had seen Reed and his dogs walking near the, the St. Mary of Wasatch School. And this is right in the foothills of the Wasatch Hills. And somebody comes forward and says they saw him walking by this school. And so the search becomes centered around, well, he must have gone into the hills and something's happened in the hills and that's where he is. This sighting, however, was never really verified. Um, when pressed, the person couldn't really identify Reed. They think it was actually one dog. And as I said, German short haired pointers are quite distinctive looking. Um, just because they are brown and white, they are Labrador size or bigger. Um, you know, they're not a mongrel with indistinctive colouring. I say that as a lover of mongrels, I own four of them. But, you know, if you were trying to describe my dog, you might have, have trouble kind of pinpointing, oh, it looks like a Jack Russell or it looks like a Passadale. I've got one that looks like nothing anyone's ever thought of before. But these are quite distinctive looking dogs. So for them to not be 100% sure, and then it turns out, oh, it's just one dog, not quite sure what color it was, maybe it was white. This is not, for me, sure enough to, to warrant all of this search. Also, the family are like, he is an Eagle Scout. That Where he is sighted is 30 minutes from walk from his house. He knew that lunch was going to be in 30 minutes. He didn't say, I'm, I'm going to walk the dogs, I'll miss, I'll miss lunch. He was going to be back for lunch. So why is he 30 minutes away walking by a school that's not his? Why is he on an October, I don't know what time it gets dark in Utah in October, but why is he walking there in a shirt and a parka and jeans? when he knows it's going to get cold, he's, it's going to get dark. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't fit for, for me and for lots of people and for the family. But this seems to be, you know, this would, I suppose, be a very nice summing up of the case. Terrible accident, took the dogs for a walk in the hills, uh, got lost, fell over, got confused, fell down a ravine, you know, it, it, it it's a nice solution because they have nothing else to go on. Not later. This sighting is later discredited, but not soon enough. At one point, police in Kansas City call the Salt Lake City police and say they found Reed. He's right there with them at the police station. What the family must have felt like is unbearable. As soon as Reed's dad starts talking to this teen on the phone, he knows it's not him and it just turns out to be an, another blonde teen. And we don't really know if he said he was Reed Taylor Jepson to, in the hope of fitting in or because he was scared or because he'd done something that he didn't want to be linked to. Uh, but it's not him. But the thought of your prayers being answered, your child is with the police, safe. They've got him there. That is that is what you want if your child is missing. And to have that then um, dashed must be awful. The case goes cold for the police. Uh, they don't seem they don't really have any leads to go on. But for the family. They never stop. They never stop looking for their son. And for Reed's father, this inability to 
fix this problem, this inability to find his child really takes its toll on his mental health. I think he was a a very uh, traditional father role in that community. You know, he provided this, this lifestyle for his family. He was a, a member of the community, a member of the church. He was a problem solver and he felt very responsible for not being able to find his son and not being able to make this okay for his family. And unfortunately, he takes his own life in December 1965, just a couple of weeks before Christmas. I mean, whatever you say about the act of completing suicide and, and the timing, uh, which must have been absolutely awful. I always flip it and think it must be so awful to feel that bad that that is for you the best option. And his wife is a complete badass and she just says to her, children, you know, we have to focus on the good times. We have to remember the wonderful times we had as a family and we are going to be okay. And she holds the family together and they are fine. The family are fine, but they never stop looking for Reed. It's, it's uh, obviously, you can say that about a lot of people who lose their family, but they never actively stop looking for their missing brother and missing son. Now, I wish the same could be said about the police, but it would later be discovered that in June 1966, the police closed the case on Reed Taylor Jepson as a runaway juvenile, which makes you think, did they, I mean, how much did they look? If they're convinced that this is a runaway case, how much looking did they do? This will all change. And, and nobody knew about this. The family didn't know about this. The family didn't have, obviously we did, they didn't have the internet. They, they just had the, the hope of, of, the, of the police doing their job. And so they carried on looking and I guess assumed that the police would carry on looking. But then on the 2nd of March, 2010, hikers in Mill Creek Canyon, just five miles from the Jepson home, find a human skull. They call in the police and the police come and search and they find enough bones to form nearly a whole human skeleton. And from the bones that they find, they can determine that this is a white male between 17 to 20 years old, five foot six to six foot one. Now, it's close to Reed. Reed is five foot six when he goes missing. He's white. He is 15 going on 16. So, it, you know, it could be. Now, Suzanne hears of this finding and calls the police and says, Do you think it's my brother? And she speaks to Detective Cody Logie. And he says, I've, I've never heard of your brother's case. And she is, is surprised, you know, and he sounds amazing. And he goes off and he comes back to her and says, I can't find any information on your brother's case. There is nothing on file for the disappearance of Reed Taylor Jepson. There's nothing in their missing persons database. <coughs> he goes and he asks the records department and they come across the long forgotten case file, which they've never digitized. And it's this way that they find that the case was closed in June 1966, which must have been devastating for, her, for his family because their mother has died in, in the mid 90s, not knowing what happened to her son. And to think that there is at least you know, with the eve of, of computers and the internet and all of that to think at least if something turns up, they'll be able to, to link it and to find that nothing, there's nothing there. 
must have been so distressing. Now, the bones, it would turn out, do not belong to Reed. They belong to Daniel No, who had gone missing around September 1978 while hitchhiking from Washington to his home state of Illinois. He had initially, when he disappeared, they were concerned that he had been a victim of John Wayne Gacy because he fit the descriptions, he fit the time frame. But his family upload their DNA to the database to, so that you know that they're able to find their their missing relative, and it pings and matches to this body that they have found in the canyon. There's no sign of foul play. It's believed that he literally just fell or got lost or ran out of resources or fell victim to the elements in some way. That There's no evidence of foul play. It's just a very sad, um, unfound death until later on. But at least his family would at least now have his remains to deal with. And the, the Jepsons don't have that. What is so incredible about this story, though, is the fact that Suzanne sees the, this, this discovery and she phones the police. She is constantly on it. Her, all the siblings are constantly, you know, thinking about their brother and trying to, to get some sort of outcome. And if they hadn't pushed, we wouldn't, you know, the, the disappearance of Reed Taylor Jepson would be a, a, a footnote in 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 wikipedia really because it would have just been oh well we don't really know what happened on the 25th of may 2010 the case of reed taylor jepson is officially reopened which means that there have been 46 years in between this reopening of the case and him going missing that is so much time in terms of a missing persons case They come up with a a sort of aged photo to show what he would look like now. Uh, And really, we've got to think about what might have happened. Kidnap by a stranger. You know, the 60s was a time when nobody really knew about stranger danger. Everyone was very trusting. It's a very strong community feel in Salt Lake City. And so, you know, oh, well, he could have been picked up by someone. He could have gotten the wrong car. With two dogs, it's, it, it, with two dogs, it seems unlikely. He doesn't need a lift. He is walking the dogs, so he's not going to be hitching a lift. You've got to assume that uh, uh, you've got to assume that a kidnapper, a non-related kidnapper, which is unusual, is going to be kidnapping for sexual purposes. I believe. The majority of non-familial kidnappings are for sexual purposes. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I believe it to be the case. And therefore, you've got to have someone who was just waiting. Had, had, had they identified Reed and they were just waiting and they didn't care about the dogs? It wasn't a regular routine that he did no one saw him walking. It wasn't a regular walking area that he went on. So they've got to just randomly be okay with the dogs. He fits the bill of what they're looking for. It just doesn't add up. Was the kidnapper waiting in the garden? Were they just sitting at the end of the garden on the off chance, knowing that he'd come out to look after the dogs? But again, you've got two big dogs who are very devoted to their owner. So you've got to bear that in mind. The dogs were not heard to be barking. They were not heard to be distressed. Um, It just doesn't fit that a very strong, fit teenage boy with two big dogs would just randomly be kidnapped or be stalked and kidnapped. There are probably loads more times when he was on his own. Did he walk back from football practice? You know, now, yes, he could have been groomed. Um, it would have been very different, but then obviously no internet, but he could have been groomed by uh, someone in a position of trust. But again, why do it with the dogs? If you're grooming someone for whatever purpose, you don't wait until they've got their two dogs out to do whatever you're going to do. The question has to be, 
did he actually never leave his garden? What evidence do we have that Reed Jepsen left his garden? We don't. And what's incredibly interesting is when this case is reopened and it's obviously republicized, police get a call from someone calling themselves Miranda. Now, Miranda and her family have moved into the house next door to the Jepsons at the end of the garden. Remember the house that was being built at the time that Reed disappeared. And they've just moved in, and while landscaping, they had dug up some bones. The way they found the bones was weird enough that they took photos because this wasn't just any bones. They dug up two plastic bags full of dog bones. Dog bones that looked like they had been surgically chopped up. Who chops up dogs and puts them in a bag? I've buried many dogs. If you've moved into my family home that I grew up in, you've got a lovely array of family dogs at the back of the garden. You don't put them in a plastic bag. You don't chop them up. Um, You might wrap them in a blanket. Uh, But no plastic bags, no chopping. The, The bones were sawed through and they were buried five to six feet deep. Again. I love the dogs, but they're not, I'm not digging six feet down. So they're so surprised by this find that she wants to speak to the police because she thinks it's very odd. Her partner says, you know, why would you speak to the police about dog bones? You know, people are weird. But they get their neighbour, who's a doctor, to come and look, and he confirms, yep, dog bones, um, two different dogs, it looks like it's been surgically chopped up, which is very weird, and they're in the plastic bags, but, you know, as you thought, definitely dog bones. They take the photos, they throw the bones away. So, on June the 12th, 2010, the photographs of the bones are sent to the, the police experts and the police immediately turn up at this house with cadaver dogs and full search team. They believe that if those are Reed's dogs, then Reed must be nearby. They bring penetrating ground radar and they search the whole garden area, especially where these bones have been found. Now, the, I believe the dogs hit on an area that is then dug and nothing. And the deeper they get, the less interest the dogs have. But it's very interesting. Now, these cadaver dogs, it's a very grim name. They are literally, that is the scent they are trained for. So every dog can be trained to follow a scent. It just depends what scent. But interestingly, these dogs usually can differentiate between dead animals and they are trained to smell human bones, human bodies. And they should be, I believe, able to tell the difference between dog, human, elephant, cow, or whatever. So it's very interesting that they do hit on this spot. But they find nothing. Now, the experts who have got, unfortunately, just the photos, they don't have the bones, obviously, they come back and say the bones appear to be from two dogs, one fully grown, one a puppy. Now, there's no way for the investigators to prove this. They don't have the bones. But they believe that they can pretty much, as far as they can, confirm that this is Reed's dogs. Bess and Anne. They can't determine also when they were buried. Obviously, they could have been buried. This is 2010. They could have been buried in 78. They could have been buried in 58. You you don't know. They are fully clean. So I guess that, you know, they weren't buried in 2009. So who lived in the house beforehand? 
uh, well, 37 year old Dr. Henry built the house for his family, his family. And it, they were living a few blocks away from the, from the Jepson home. And he was building this house for them and, and spending time there every, most days during the week to oversee the house build. And they f- officially moved in a few months after Reed went missing. And they lived there for 40 years. They weren't close with the Jepsons, but obviously the community feel, the church feel, they, they will have known who the Jepsons were. As far as we can tell, they bought the piece of land from the Jepsons, so they must have been aware. Also, it was big news. This young boy goes missing from this tight-knit community. It was big news. Everyone was looking. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone was concerned. Now, Dr. Henry's wife dies by suicide in the 1980s. And one of his daughters, we think, was friends with one of Reed's sisters. Um, But two things are particularly interesting, apart from the fact that they lived there. Dr. Henry was an orthopedic doctor, i.e. a doctor of bones. And something I hadn't thought of about before was the use of plastic rubbish bags was not common in the 60s. They were not under everyone's kitchen sink like they are now. They were not a household item. They were used primarily in the medical field. So it's not, shit, I've killed some dogs. I need to dispose of them. I'm going to nip inside and get a bin bag. You wouldn't have had that. You might have had something else, but plastic bags? No, no, no. They were for medical. It's the equivalent now of finding something in a medical waste bag. You know, we don't have those at home. So you've got an orthopedic surgeon who will have had access to the plastic bags. And one thing that that Miranda's family found when they moved in, which was slightly strange, was in the basement of the house, there was a surgical table set up. Now, obviously at the time that that this all comes out, uh, Dr. Henry's first wife has died. And he doesn't really open up about anything. It's a pretty weird thing to find. Even if you are an orthopedic surgeon, I don't think it's okay for you to to do that kind of work at home in your basement in non-surgical settings. So why have it set up? He also had a reputation for sexual abuse against teenage boys. Now, this was considered more of an open secret. Um, The Jepsons weren't necessarily aware. I don't know that he was their doctor. Obviously their father was a doctor. So it wasn't sort of that much of an open secret, but it was a time when things were overlooked. Things were not talked about. Um, You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that would have been, the awful horror outrage that it is hopefully now. There was only one complaint filed to the police, and by that time the statute of limitations was up. By the time the law was put in place to remove the statute of limitations for sex crimes against minors, that, that was 2013. So that this was way before. So, you know, 1964, if if someone was thought of as molesting children, patients, you might just choose to not send your child there. You wouldn't necessarily do anything more than that. Now, in 2011, police spoke to Dr. Henry, who says that the dogs buried were the family dog that was buried in the backyard. His daughter interviewed separately without knowing what her father had said, said they never owned a dog, let alone buried one. Uh, Dr. Henry says he doesn't even know Reed. 
In fact, he then told the investigators he'd appreciate it if they found out who killed Reed. And police say, hang on a minute, we are looking for missing persons. We don't think he's dead. I mean, obviously they do. Why do, why do you assume he's dead? And he says he's a runaway and I know that this length of time they're never going to find him. And he laughs as he says this, it's, which is just, you know, is it, does it mean he's guilty? No. If I was being interviewed by the police about a missing kid, I wouldn't laugh at any point would I think this is something where humour it comes into play. Some family have lost their child. Your neighbours have lost lost their child. He uh, does a sort of stress test, and he plays games while they're administering the test. He, you know, they did they do um, sort of test questions. You know, what colour is the grass? Blah blah blah. He would say the grass is blue. You know, he just didn't take it seriously. He took the piss. And whether he passed or not, we don't know. It was inconclusive or he failed. Police say that he's very intelligent, but he's ang- arrogant, he's pompous. He's obviously not emotionally engaged with what's going on. But he then asked to do a second test, which he passes. Now, the reliability of these tests is completely not accepted. They did a test uh, with some drug addicts about whether they they use drugs or not uh, to sort of see the reliability of this test and lots of them passed so it's it's an unreliable test at the best of time we know that people with psychopathic tendencies can can pass any kind of lie detector test so it's not very conclusive but his behavior throughout is not really okay and the, the dog situation, you know, yep, I buried our family dog. Uh, it, if you are not guilty, if they dug up dog bones in my garden that I hadn't buried, I'd be like, God, no, no idea. Don't know. I have no idea how they got there. But to say, oh, yeah, that's a family dog, family dog, family pet that you never owned. Why lie? Very weird. So, um, Miranda then does some work on the basement of the house. She calls the police back in and says, look, while we're digging up and fixing the pipework in the basement, do you want to come back and have a look there? They bring the, the dogs back. The dogs again hit on something. They dig, they dig, they don't find anything. Again, the deeper they dig, the less interest the dogs show. So is there blood that seeped into the soil? that the dogs can kind of get a scent of, but obviously there's nothing there now. So Detective Logie says that they were so thorough at both houses that he doubts that Reed is there. They dig as deep as eight foot down. And yeah, the deeper they dug, the less interested the dogs became. And he, he just thinks, you know, they would have found him if he was there. Now that doesn't mean that he wasn't there. Again, in October, 2013, Dr. Henry is spoken to, um, and former patients of his and his kids. They, they have no evidence to make an arrest. They also don't know that Reed is dead. It, It could be that his dogs died separately to him and he did decide to run away but Suzanne and and many people believe that Reed Taylor Jepson was killed by his neighbor Dr Henry and this makes sense in terms of Reed never leaving the garden did Dr Henry say can you just come and help me with something in the house because he was building the house obviously and disposes of him and the dogs. Um, did he have a sexual interest in Reed? Uh, it, it just, for me, makes more sense that Reed never kind of left that area. He dies at the age of 88 in 2016. He's still considered a person of interest in Reed's case. 
Uh, Reed's family have put a headstone for him at the family plot with his birth date and the date he went missing. But they still have no answers. They have no body to lay them to rest. And although, obviously, uh, they have someone that they believe is responsible, they have no way of proving that. And uh, this could be a, a, a horrible defamatory podcast by taking his name in vain. But for me, a couple of things stand out. Um, the pretending that the dog was a family dog that was buried by you uh, when you didn't ever own a family dog. The use of plastic bags, which would have been medical, and the chopping up of the bones. Why kill the dogs and not the person? If you see what I mean. If the dogs annoy you, kill the dogs. We've, we've definitely, there are, there are cases out there of people, people's neighbours. It happened to my brother-in-law. Um, his dog was killed by a neighbour who threw poison over the fence because they were sick of the dog barking. You, just because you dispose of the dogs, where did the child go? And vice versa. Why did you need to get rid of the dogs if you just wanted the boy? And I suspect that that would point to him not being out with the dogs. Once they're out in public, you have to move quickly. Two dogs on leads, getting into a car against their will, strong teenage boy, very difficult. Can you come and help me just hold the ladder while I put this up? The dogs are there. If the dogs return without him, that raises suspicions. Just get rid of all the evidence. I'd love to know what you think. It's a real, I hope you see what I mean when I feel like this case could be solved, but probably never will be. Um, it's, it's really distressing. It's, it's just slightly, I mean, I, I've been awake in the middle of the night thinking about it. Do check out the um, social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, the Monday Night Review. You can email me at the Monday Night Review at gmail.com. I love to hear from you, so send me an email. Tell me what your favorite cases are, what you think on this case, and all of that good stuff. And until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive. <laughs>